Kung flu? What are you doing in this country? Why hey, doesn't stop. she go back to where she came oh from? My God. <laughs> A racist-filled rant against a SoCal Asian family at a restaurant in Carmel has gone viral. Oh, my God. Since the COVID crisis began, many Asian Americans have been targeted by racial slurs. Everything goes from China. And even physical attacks. We're being attacked. Uh, that's been happening throughout the country. Kung flu, China virus, the China plague. Our leader is spewing out xenophobic slurs and hate. Um, that's not okay. Asian American hate is as old as American history. Chinese were driven out in town after town and their homes destroyed. The Chinese became undesirable. When I was a child, Pearl Harbor was bombed. Overnight, this country was swept up in naked, outright hatred of people who looked like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. No no Ugly parts of America have come into light. Staying quiet is not an option anymore. <laughs> Asians and black activists have always come together against a common enemy, which is obviously white supremacy and racism. Democracy is not a product you buy. It's not a project you finish. It's a process that you engage in. I'm ready to vote. Early voting starts on October 17th. Everything seems to have been shaken up. All of our voices need to be heard. Hello, I'm Elaine Quijano. Last October, CBS News aired the broadcast Asian Americans Battling Bias. Since then, the hate and harassment has not stopped. It is on the rise. Earlier this month, eight people, including six women of Asian descent, were shot to death at several Atlanta area spas. A suspect was arrested and charged, yet authorities say it is too soon to tell if this was racially motivated. This latest tragedy has shaken the Asian American community to its very core, and there is reason for concern. A new report says bias attacks against Asian Americans have spiked nearly 150 percent since the pandemic. Because of this continuing crisis, we want to take a closer look at the issues facing the AAPI community by having candid conversations about the fear, pain, violence, sexism and racism that persist in our society. But first, CBS News senior White House correspondent Weijia Zhang has the latest. Every time I go somewhere, I feel like uh, I'm endangered for my life. 27-year-old Denny Kim was on his way to dinner when two men approached him on a Los Angeles sidewalk. They started calling me Chinese virus. They started calling me a They started calling me a uh, They started telling me to go back to China, even though I'm not even Chinese. I'm Korean American. Kim, a U.S. Air Force veteran, said the assault quickly turned physical. The assailants, when they were beating me up on the ground, they told me that they wanted to kill me just because they were filled with hate. Stop Asian hate! And Kim was not alone. Love Asian people! No hate! No fear! Asian people are welcome! No A groundswell of support for Asian Americans has spread across the country. After eight people were murdered in the Atlanta metro area, six of them women of Asian descent. Hyun Jung Grant was a 51-year-old single mother and leaves behind two sons. Older son Randy Park wrote, she was one of my best friends and the strongest influence on who we are today. Losing her has put a new lens on the amount of hate that exists in our world. Victim Xiao Jie Tan would have turned 50 the week she was killed. Her 29-year-old daughter Jamie Webb said her mother dreamed of traveling the world and love to make friends with all her customers. She's a hard worker. I just don't know why this happened to her. So far, I still couldn't accept it. 
Just days after the shootings, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris visited Atlanta and implored Americans to speak out against racism. Our silence is complicity. We cannot be complicit. We have to speak out. We have to act. Harris is the nation's first vice president of South Asian descent. This is about who we are as a nation and also the right to be recognized as an American, not as the other, not as them, but as us. The Atlanta massacre unfolded as violence against the Asian American Pacific Islander community surged in the past year. Hey, Why doesn't stop. she go back to where she came from? Oh Including Man, thousands of verbal assaults. An Asian piece of <laughs> Smile for the <laughs> Yo, smile for the Asian. Oh my God. <laughs> and reported physical attacks, some against the elderly. Surveillance videos captured an ugly scene, a man in New York City kicking and stomping a 65-year-old Asian-American woman. As a nearby security guard watched but did not intervene. Nearly 4,000 incidents against Asian-Americans have been reported since the start of the pandemic. One study found the number of hate crimes has increased by about 150% in major U.S. cities. I talk about the Chinese virus, and, uh, and I mean it, that's where it came from. Advocates say former President Trump's rhetoric weaponized the coronavirus against Asian Americans. Kung flu. Yeah. Kung flu. The AAPI community has reached a crisis point, demanding to be seen as Americans. I am proud to be Asian. I am proud to be Asian. I belong here. I belong here. In late March, President Biden announced several new steps to tackle the violence, including creating a committee to end xenophobia and offering more resources. The Justice Department launched a new initiative to expedite reviews of hate crimes in 30 days. Earlier in the month, the House Judiciary Committee held a hearing on the surge in attacks against Asian Americans. Asian Americans must not be used as scapegoats in times of crisis. Lives are at stake, and it's critical that Congress takes bold action to address this pandemic of discrimination and hate. But Texas Congressman Chip Roy questioned if a crime should be linked to hate. Who decides what is hate? Who decides what is the kind of speech that deserves policing? Roy also defended the use of anti-Chinese rhetoric used to describe the virus. I'm not going to be ashamed of saying I oppose the Chai Coms. I oppose New York Congresswoman Chinese Grace Meng fired back. This hearing was to address the hurt and pain of our community and to, to find solutions, and we will not let you take our voice away from us. She shared several voicemails her office has received to show the racism is real. Chinese virus, kung flu, you kung flu. Mike Wynn is also all too familiar with the hate. He was stunned to see this at his ramen shop in San Antonio, Texas, the words Kung Flu, Kami, and I hope you die covering the windows. The next escalation is going to be either physical harm or even something fatal. So, you know, that's very worrisome for me. So you worry that you could lose your life? Yeah, absolutely. You know, people have, you know, threatened my life. They say, I hope you die. You know, people say that they, they want to find where I live and burn down my house. Now, both he and Kim are trying to raise even more awareness. I think what needs to happen is more awareness and actual charging people with hate crimes, showing that we're not going to, this is not tolerable. Proud to be Asian! Proud to be Asian! With new government action and increased grassroots action by Asian Americans around the country. Asian racism! 
Denny is still hopeful about the country he served. Even though I got beat up just because of the way I looked, that does not mean that I'm gonna give up on this country and I'm not gonna give up on the people that live here. I still represent America and what it stands for because I am a US Air Force vet. I'm gonna keep continue fighting. I'm gonna keep continue spreading awareness. We're all just one human race, that's it. Ahead, Asian American activists and thought leaders talk candidly about what it's like to live in America in 2021. To discuss the impact and rise in anti-Asian bias attacks, I'm joined now by actress Olivia Munn, actor Daniel Day Kim, AAPI Stop the Hate co-founder Russell Jung, RISE founder and CEO Amanda Wynn, and chef Melissa King. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here. Um, we're coming together at a really difficult time, but I want to talk about back in March of 2020, because that's when an FBI report warned of an increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans as the coronavirus spread. And Russell, I know your organization, Stop AAPI Hate, has been a place where people have turned to report hate incidents what do the data show? Where are these incidents happening and who's being targeted? Thanks. Well, since March last year, when we started our website tracker, we've received almost 3,800 incidents from Asian Americans about the incidents of hate that they've been experiencing. And they've been horrific. People have had slurs slung at them. They've had racial profanities. Um, they've been pushed and shoved. We've received reports from all 50 states now so it's widespread, it's commonplace, and I think it's led to an atmosphere and a, a fear and anxiety within the community. Um, Amanda, you posted this video on social media in early February, drawing attention to recent attacks, particularly against Asian American elders. Why did you create that video? Quite simply, I didn't see our stories getting represented in the mainstream media and I wanted people to understand what was happening in our community. You know, I, I think that when that video was posted, it was like fire meets gasoline because not only did people feel like their grief was being brought to light and that they could be validated in how they were feeling, but also other communities said, oh, that is a clear call to action. And that's something that I want to help with. And I'm so grateful to everyone who has stepped up to speak up about this issue. Uh, Olivia, you have used your platform to speak out about anti-Asian hate. How do you think Hollywood has shaped perceptions of Asians and Asian Americans, and particularly Asian American women? And are things changing at all, do you think? I think that we're all well aware of the the fetishization of, of Asian women in Hollywood and um, in media. And, um, you know, for so long, white people have been able to tell our stories. And um, as all minorities, we're just allowed to support them in telling those stories. So it's really through their eyes and through their opinions of us, it's slowly changing. Um, and, you know, the the people on this call, we're, we're all part of that change and that movement. Melissa, as someone in the culinary world who's enjoyed much success, what have things been like for you and your family? Because you were telling me that, you know, being in California, you're accustomed to seeing other Asians, Asian Americans, but this feels different to you, that in 2021, you have a real fear for your parents who immigrated to this country from Hong Kong and China. Um, it's just been very upsetting, things that are happening within the restaurant industry itself with uh, vandalism uh, of restaurants, uh, a drop in just patronage uh, of Asian restaurants. And so it, it, it's it's really become personal for me. Um, and that's where, yeah, I do fear for people of like my parents' age who are elderly and you know I fear for their safety. I fear for them walking down the street at night and what's going to happen. Uh, there is this uh, concept of the model minority stereotype. And, you know, Daniel, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and how that uh, tends to diminish the racial experiences of people within this very diverse group known as the AAPI community. 
Sure, it's a great question because, you know, um, the AAPI community is not a monolith. As we all know, there are many countries that make up uh, Asia and, a lot, and all, none of them are the same. So we have been lucky that many of us have been successful because of the, uh, the brain drain that happened in the mid 60s, bringing over professionals and then people in the science and medical fields. But we've also had refugees and immigrants coming from Southeast Asia. And so the disparity between uh, the highest earning Asians and the lowest is the largest of any ethnic group in the country. And so it does a great disservice to those of us when we need services from the government and, and, our, and our community to, to not be able to ask or to be considered uh, okay by them because they see doctors and lawyers and CEOs, and so we're considered to be fine. So what Daniel said about the model minority stereotype, um, thinking we're um, white adjacent, that's been part of the issue. But there's another stereotype that's really been stoking the racism. You know, like two years ago, we were crazy rich Asians and beloved, but in times of war, in times of pandemic, in times of economic downturn, were pushed out from being insiders to America to being outsiders of America. Um, Amanda, I want to turn to you because Russell used a word that I think some people will not be familiar with, this idea of being white adjacent. What are the implications of that? When people consistently erase our humanity, right? When they say, oh, you know, are they people of color? Are they white adjacent? All of this comes from systemic oppression and systemic erasure of us, yellow fever. You know, Olivia talking about how Hollywood has had tropes of sexualization, fetishizing the API female body. All of this really stems from lack of education and lack of empathy. Can you give us a sense, Olivia, of what it's like to be an Asian American woman in Hollywood? Typically, uh, as an Asian American, uh, uh, as an Asian American woman, the, the the roles are to be the submissive wife um, or to be the out of control wife and perpetuating the stereotype that we are either submissive or crazy. Um, and, you know, for me, it's it, it has meant that I don't work as much as I would want to because, you know, in order to work, I'd have to take a lot more of those offers. It takes a long time of just saying no to a lot of stuff and hoping that that will dry out one river so that another river can come through. What's interesting is um, back to kind of what Olivia was saying was within her industry, it's the white man telling the story of, of us. And within the restaurant world, it's the same thing. You know, this has been happening for a long time where, you know, people have come here from Asia and we're not allowed to create our food. We have to create sort of this Americanized version of our food. And now with what's happening today with um, the pandemic as a whole, that's affected, that's completely wiped out the restaurant industry. But on top of that, I've been seeing and hearing of personal friends in New York that have restaurants where they have to close down their operating hours early in order to ensure the safety of their staff. And so it's, it's, it's not just these isolated incidences, it's, it's everywhere happening. You know, there's so much to unpack here in our final minutes. I just want to go around and ask people, what is it that people who are allies or want to be allies can do to help? What would you say to those people? We're orientalized. We're often seen from other people's point of view. We don't have our own narratives being told. And so I would tell our allies, hear our, hear our stories, hear how we want to be portrayed, hear how we are human, um, how we're grieving now over the shootings of our community. Olivia, what would you say to people who want to help or learn more? I would say that right now, people speaking up on social media has, is such a, a huge source of strength uh, uh, for a lot of us because we have gone for so long feeling invisible and unseen and that these attacks on our community are not important enough for people to uh, clog up their timeline. And so just having that, and especially other um, people in our community, but in other communities and other minority communities speaking up, that has meant so much. Daniel? Not everyone will understand the Asian American experience. 
in the same way that we'll never, we'll never understand the African-American experience. But it doesn't mean we can't seek to understand. And I think that is really important because in order for a movement like this to grow, it requires all of us. Amanda, I'll give you the last word. How can people help? I think that some people may want to be allies but are afraid of saying the wrong thing or they just don't know how. So let me just encourage people to reach out to the Asian American Pacific Islanders within your life and reach out to not only those who are speaking up, but also to those who may be afraid to. So well said. This is a conversation that will continue. Olivia Munn, Daniel Day Kim, Russell Jung, Amanda Wynn, and Melissa King. This has meant so much to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you all so very much. Coming up, the devastating effects of COVID-19 on Asian American lives and livelihoods. While Asian Americans have been on the front lines during this pandemic, working and fighting to save lives, the COVID crisis has been crushing Asian American businesses. Many have been forced to close and some will never recover. In October, I reported on the dangers for frontline healthcare workers and also went to New York City's Chinatown to see how one restaurant owner has been working to keep his business open and his community safe. We're on mean? Mott Street right now. This is the main street of Chinatown. It's Friday night in Chinatown in New York City. Yeah, there are a lot of empty tables, yeah. empty chairs. Yeah. What do you think when you see that? It hurts. Patrick Mock manages the bakery at 46 Mott in the heart of this neighborhood. He's seen countless storefronts shuttered. What everyone was feeling in March, Chinatown was feeling it in January already when you f was first hearing about the pandemic overseas and because of xenophobia and racism. It hurt us our busiest time of year, which is Lunar New Year's. From February to April, an estimated 233,000 Asian American businesses closed across the country. And over the past seven months, the Asian unemployment rate has tripled. Uh, We've been taking a hit since January. Then COVID happened, now we're all hurting. Mock pleaded with New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio in August. This video of the mayor turning away went viral. De Blasio later said he was grateful for Mock's ideas and advocacy. Thank you very much. I was pissed off. One minute you're thanking me for what I'm doing for a community. The next minute you, you, turned, your, you turned away when I wasn't done with what I have to say. COVID-19 has touched all Americans, even President Donald Trump. President Trump is at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center tonight. But people of color have been hit hardest by the pandemic. One recent analysis found Asian patients with COVID-19 were 57% more likely to be hospitalized than white patients and 49% more likely to die. Yesterday, my daughter celebrated her birthday. And of course, you know, she wished her dad was here. Nina Batayola and her husband, Don Ryan, found their life's calling as occupational therapists. But in late March, Don Ryan was hospitalized with COVID-19. He started to feel sick after working with a patient and colleagues who later tested positive. Don Ryan died on April 4th. He was 40 years old. Every day is a reminder. So I felt like a change would be good for us. Do you have anything here? Oh. Last month, Batayola and her two children moved from New Jersey to California to be closer to family. What would you say about the, the toll that this has been taking? I know some of the people still don't believe that it, this is true unless it's happened to them and unless it's happened to somebody that they know. But this is real. The Batayola family's struggles are part of a new chapter of hardship for Asian Americans, says Star Trek actor George Takei. We're going through a very traumatic time for Asian Americans. 
It's part of a history in this country that includes the internment of Japanese Americans like Takei and his family during World War II. What do you think this current COVID-19 pandemic has revealed about how Asian Americans are viewed today? I don't think it's anything new. Each chapter is unique and different, the forces have played on us, but it all stems from hatred of people who look different. The data sources that we used really don't adequately represent the Asian American population because it's such a diverse population. Cardiologist Dr. Nilay Shah studies health disparities at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. The South Asian and the Filipino American population are known to have higher rates, for example, of diabetes. And diabetes is known to be a predisposing factor to worse outcomes. The Asian American population is on track to be the largest minority population in the United States in the coming decades. I think that we need to make sure that we're representing our data equally to the representation of diversity of the American population. Back in New York City's Chinatown, Patrick Mock hits the streets each week, handing out food and masks to his neighbors. I know, I promised you. Yeah. But I see the same people over and over again, buying the same things like my cup noodles to my sticky rice. Just one? Yeah, yeah. just one. I was thinking, oh, they might be homeless. And that's why I really wanted to give back to my community, because When you're at your lowest point and you find people that's willing to help you, you appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a new generation of Asian American activists joins the social justice movement. Asian Americans, like black Americans, are having a moment of racial reckoning. The rise in bias attacks has prompted many Asian Americans to discover their place as people of color in a country experiencing social change. Since the pandemic, they've been joining forces to make sure their voices are heard and that allyship is growing stronger. Last October, CBS News correspondent Nancy Chen spent time with two Los Angeles business owners who have found a way to build unity and community one meal at a time. Yeah. I think tacos are like a quintessentially LA food. Everybody eats tacos. Everybody does indeed eat tacos, including the homeless in South Los Angeles. And you wanted 10 meals, right? Which is why every Friday, local meals. restaurant owner Susan Park gives away thousands for free. And people feel like they're cared for. You know, it's like it's a food hug. The park is giving more than just a food hug. It's her way of supporting Black Lives Matter as she serves predominantly black neighborhoods. I know that it was black people and black bodies that were at the front lines of fighting for the Civil Rights Act to be passed. Their bodies were brutalized, and yet I benefit. Park created the Facebook page, Asian Americans for Black Lives Matter, after the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. This summer, the movement was reignited after George Floyd was killed, with many Asian Americans joining in the protests. Among them, 32-year-old Tiffany So. COVID-19 definitely sparked another awakening where Asian Americans um, and some younger generations of Asian Americans have been for the first time experiencing uh, this more overt in your face racism. Part of that awakening includes starting conversations about racial injustices with their families, bridging different views across generations as they question their place in America's racial fabric. Because race is talked about as if everything's black and white, Asian immigrants sometimes wonder, where do we fit in? Frank Wu is president of Queens College in New York. He's a scholar of Asian American studies. It's a moral dilemma. Are you going to declare 
that you're a person of color, or do you aspire to be an honorary white, or do you just get excluded as a perpetual foreigner, right? Those are the those options. Those are not good options at right? all. Right, yes. Yeah, none of those is good. Wu says part of that forced identity is shaped by the idea of the model minority, a belief that Asian Americans are more successful than other minorities because of hard work. It's false flattery. It's not even really a compliment of Asian Americans. It's just a way to denigrate other people of color, of saying, look at the Asians. They made it. Why can't you? Stereotypes like these led to years of mistrust and unconscious bias among the communities. In the 70s, Korean Americans opened businesses in underserved neighborhoods in South LA. Sometimes there was tension. Frustrations came to a head in 1991 when 15 year old Latasha Harlins was killed after a Korean store owner accused her of stealing orange juice. In this graphic security video, Harlins is shot in the back. Find the defendant, Stacy C. Kuhn, not guilty of the crime of assault. And then a year later, when a jury acquitted white police officers for beating Rodney King, Los Angeles erupted. <laughs> Abandoned by law enforcement, stores were looted across South LA. More than 60% of the damage on Korean American businesses. Where's your human dignity? A history that motivates Danny Park today to build bridges. His family has operated a convenience shop in South LA for more than two decades. But after taking over the business, the 28 year old is now empowering and uniting the community by training residents for jobs at his healthy food market. Among the items sold, an orange juice named after Latasha Harlins. Why do you think it's important to put that out front and have a reminder of that and remember in such a way? Um, I think it's a way to honor uh, our ancestor, um, honoring our ancestor, Latasha Harlins, who's been killed and who has transitioned. We're working on ensuring that the violence and the harms don't happen again. Change is slowly coming from a cup of orange juice to athletes like U.S. Open champion Naomi Osaka, who wore masks honoring black lives. The solidarity is inspiring to actor and activist George Takei. It is a much more heartening kind of movement with the, the diversity of America coming together. As Susan Park continues to serve, Our street. She still receives dozens of messages from Asian Americans who want to get involved. You just listen to people and show that you care about them and that they want you to be their friend. Communities working together to create change. When we come back, we will continue the conversation. Was the Atlantic killing spree a watershed moment for Asian Americans? We'd like to continue our conversation about the challenges Asian Americans are facing. I'm joined right now by actor Tai Ma, author, producer, director, and chef Eddie Wong, activist and journalist Helen Zia, actress Jennifer Chon Garcia, and television personality and podcast host Cheryl Burke. Welcome and thank you all so much for joining us. You know, I want to begin with a question to the panel, starting with you, Jen. When you heard about the shootings at the Asian spas in Georgia, what went through your mind? Many, many things went through my mind. I mean, it's, I still get really emotional when I think about it. And I just thought to myself, you know, when I heard that 911 call, that sounds like how my father speaks. And it just, um, it made me so sick because I could hear how calm and how afraid she was, but, um, that's why I think it's so important that we have conversations like this and people coming together to talk about this because this can't happen. It can't happen anymore. You know, this is the culmination for Asian Americans of 15 months ever since the coronavirus was first detected that our communities have been under siege. And many of us, um, even back at the beginning of this year said this was going to be bad. Some of us even privately talked about the possibility of mass killings because we knew it was possible. And so here we are 
kind of at our worst nightmare. And sad to say, I don't think it's over yet. Cheryl, what about you? What did you think? I am still in shock. It's hard to process. I lost sleep. Um, my family, they're from the Bay Area. I have family in Atlanta. And I can't help but think, um, God forbid, you know, just those, those cries for help. The fact that they're not saying if this is a hate crime or the fact that they even had to think about it. I mean, call it as it is. It's really frustrating that this is 2021. And, you know, like Helen said, I don't think it's over. Uh, Ty, what about you? When I first heard the news, I was heartbroken. I could not get, a, get rid of the sadness that was washed over me. I wish I could say I was shocked and surprised. Unfortunately, I'm not. I've been in the trenches for many years and, and I'm familiar with Helen's work. We, we've, you know, we've marched, we've done demonstrations. Uh, we're, we're not as silent as people say we are. We've been active for many, many years, all the way back when the first railroad workers who came from China to build this continental railroad of ours. So I, I, am, I am proud of who we are. And, and I want to remind everybody, we are children of those people who came under tremendous hardship. Unlike Ty, I was in shock. I was definitely in shock. Um, you know, my parents, the, the other parents at Chinese school and grandparents, um, ever since I was a kid had always told us, you know, this isn't our country. Um, they, they always would tell us that, you know, be good, do your homework, follow the rules. This isn't our country. We're not fully equal here. And don't cause any trouble. Don't rock the boat. And I've been very outspoken my entire life. But watching this um, for the first time, I just, I, I was really in shock. Like people really hate us. Like right now. I'm curious, in the wake of what we saw take place and what we have been seeing recently with this anti-Asian violence, show of hands, how many of you are fearful right now? Raise your hands. <laughs> pretty, pretty much everyone. How many of you are angry right now? Uh, Helen, let me start with you, why? Well, as um, all the other panelists said, this is not new. It's our particular role that white supremacy and systemic racism has given to Asian Americans to isolate us, to blame us, to attack us. All of us on this panel were aware of just the intensity of the hate that was going on starting 15 months ago. And it's infuriating that it's taken a terrible, you know, mass killing for other people to recognize it. Jen, you had your hand up too. What is making you angry in this moment? It's still an ongoing fight. My mom was born and raised in Mexico City, and my dad was uh, born in Korea and uh, grew up in Seoul. There's nothing about their, their, their cultures <laughs> that were the same. And I mean, they still don't even really speak the same language, but what they spoke was that American dream that coming to a promised land and for the opportunity for my brother, my sister and myself and our kids and our kids, 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 kids. And we're still here. And even though you're born of American, you have an American passport, you have a Canadian passport, you are still treated like a foreigner. And that's why I'm angry. Why do you choose violence? I'm just, I'm, I'm over it. Sorry, I kind of lost my color. <laughs> no, listen, this is why we're having this conversation, Jen. Do not apologize for how you feel. Ty, let me ask you, uh, because of your extensive uh, career and, you know, I, I am looking across the landscape now at our institutions in this country. How has Hollywood shaped perceptions of Asians and particularly Asian Americans? Well, in the beginning, you know, we're the convenient scapegoat. We're the yellow peril. You know, we're the Fu Manchus and we're the, we are the Susie Wongs. And hopefully, you know, all, all the, uh, um, the collective effort 
of Oscar to White, Me Too movement, all, all of those things have assisted the change in Hollywood. I'm shooting a show in Vancouver, and it's the first time I've ever had an Asian American woman showrunner, ever. All of the entire writer's room is reflexive of inclusion and representation. Women, people of color, LGBTQ, all our directors also reflect that. I have never seen that ever. So that's progress. Yeah, I would agree with Ty and um, you know, amazing work that Ty did on The Farewell. It really helped a lot. I mean, that was one of the first films to, you know, really, really um, give dimension to Asian characters. In Hollywood, Asians have always been the butt of jokes. Mm. And how do you become the butt of jokes? Well, first you have to dehumanize us. You have to strip us of our agency. You have to strip us of our dimension. You have to fragment and break us down. I love Breakfast at Tiffany's, but look at what they did to, the, I mean, there's a yellow face character in that film that's absolutely disgusting. Hollywood history is, is, is riddled with stuff like this and we're just coming out of it. But I think it's about reclaiming our humanity. And I do think it will make it a, a much harder to attack us physically once um, people see us as whole human characters. And that's what I've done with Boogie, is I've presented a film that is very true to my experience, my emotions. Jen, does this feel like an inflection point to you for Asian Americans? I mean, I'm, I am optimistic, but I am cautiously optimistic. I know that there are good people on this earth. I know that there are way more good people than they are bad. It's just the bad has had the microphone for a very, very long time. But we're taking that microphone back. All right, well, Tai Ma, Eddie Wong, Helen Zia, Jennifer Chun Garcia, and Cheryl Burke, what a privilege it has been to talk to you all tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you guys. Thank, Thank you, you. So much. For Asian Americans, the last year has been a battle, a battle for their lives in a pandemic, a battle against bias, a battle for respect. But most of all, it has always been a struggle to be seen and heard as the Americans we know we are. For all of my colleagues at CBS News, I'm Elaine Quijano. Thank you for watching Asian Americans Battling Bias, Continuing Crisis. We hope it encourages a more united States of America. It was a lockdown. They opened the fire. Them bullets was flying. Who said it was a lockdown? Goddamn lie. Oh my, time heals all, but you out of time now. Judge gotta watch us from the clock tower. Little tear gas cleared the whole place out. I'll be back with the hazmat for the next round. We was trying to protest and the fires broke out. Look out for the secret agents, they be planted in the crowd. Set a civil unrest, but you sleep so sound like you don't hear the screams when we catching beat down. Staying quiet when the killing is, but you speak loud when we ride. Got opinions coming from a place of privilege. Sicker than the COVID, how they did them on the ground. Speaking of the COVID, is it still going around? Oh, won't you tell me about the looting? What's that really all about? Cause they throw away black lives like paper towels plus unemployment.